Now on this, which is now volume 32 of our question and answer video, I'm going to try to answer some questions. A lot of them are going to concern carbon fiber work and making prototype parts. Some of them concern things like chains and normal motorcycle maintenance issues. But at the end, the, basically the second half of the video is devoted to some of the questions and answers of making prototype carbon fiber parts and a photo show of making an R1 carbon fiber exhaust system from high temperature Huntsman resin. Now, I don't know how much of that is interesting to the, the people that subscribe to the videos, but it's something we haven't talked about in a long time. And it's something that every once in a while I'll get a question or an inquiry about it. And you can watch this in 4K, just adjust your YouTube device. So some of the things we're going to share on this video, people have sent in comments on the channel, of course. People have sent in some pictures of their restoration projects and updating them. And somewhere on the video, probably at the end, I'm going to talk about and try to do a 101 carbon fiber for people that maybe have never made a carbon fiber part or they're new to it and they'd like a few tips and tricks. I'm in the middle of making one right now and I'll share all of the things that I think will make it practical and easy if you're new to carbon fiber work. So our first comment that came in on a video, we changed two chains on two different bikes and posted the videos already and within the last month, I think. And a fellow named Fred gave me some input and this is the kind of input I like to get and I like to share. He said he's got a, a bike with 22,000 miles on the chain and he's been meticulous about lubing it and cleaning it. And he said, then he noticed one day, uh, this happened to me on the GS. You're looking at the bike, at the chain as it's going around a sprocket. All of a sudden one link is not connecting right. It had a bad link, a frozen link, whatever. And so he sent the feedback that from now on, he, he's gonna do 17,000 miles as a better choice. And I thought, well, we did ours at 17 plus. And I'm not sure, maybe I should have done it at 15. I don't know, because at the end, at, at the end, that chain was getting noisy. And I, I know that nothing good is happening when it's making noise. So maybe the information that we should be sharing is if you're in doubt and you don't know, or if you tend to neglect the chain, maybe 15,000 is a great time to do it. And every other time you do it, replace the sprockets. Now, if you ride all, all year long and you ride through the salt and through the leaves and through the dust and the dirt and, and or you're not prone to do the meticulous cleaning of the chain, uh, you could shorten that, but I don't think you could lengthen it. And riding around with a chain that's really worn, you're damaging your sprockets. And we try to ride all year long. I don't want to ever get stuck because in the middle of the whole thing, my chain let go. Now, a fellow named Tech Mo. Tecmo watched the brake pulsing video that I posted and he was very happy because he thought it might not work. He did it meticulously as I showed on the video. Brake pulsing went away. Now to be honest, to be really honest about this, and I don't want to make, make it sound like this works every time, but it works more than half the time. Because a lot of times the rotors are so warped that that isn't going to solve the problem. And if you think about it, the rotors are floating and the, the part that's attached to the hub is stationary. So it's doing this and the buttons have to make up for that adjustment. Now, I remember when Luciano gave Larry, the late Larry Dettori, a, a, a 500 Kawasaki track bike that he had and the front brake that was so loose that it was you were looking at it and saying, oh, I wonder if that's going to work. Well. The, the downside of having it too loose is when you hit a bump, it sounds like somebody hit the front end with a hammer. Mm. I've had it both ways. I've made the buttons too loose. Mm. If you just do it a little bit at a time, and usually by the time, by the time you need to do it, if you can't turn those buttons, like it shows on the video, and your lever is doing this, sometimes that'll cure it right away. And for, for Mo, obviously it did. Now Scott shared these photos of a bike he restored. One of the bikes in his collection, as many in his collection. It's a bobber and what he did, somebody backed into it and crushed the front fender. He had to search around to get a fender too. He said it was not a, uh, an easy job. 
and he got the re luckily he had enough paint left over from painting the bike you didn't have to worry about getting a paint match always a good idea and it looks like it's done now here's a comment from a gentleman named turbo boy and let me emphasize this is not turbo steve turbo steve is a totally different person and he says he says in the comment he says i'm not turbo steve i don't know if that means mm, i don't know well anyway turbo turbo boy i don't know <laughs> he has a zx 14r with a Kaufman pipe. I'm not familiar with any of these aftermarket exhausts. But anyway, he put on a Del Kevic, that's the one that, that Luciano likes, and to quiet it down. And the reason is, this is really funny, he says, I think I'm getting old that I want a quiet pipe. And my response to him was really perfect. When you're getting old, you don't put on a Del Kevic pipe, Del Kevic, however you say it, pipe. You put the stock exhaust back on, and you're glad you did because you're not getting tickets anymore. Ask me how I know. And I love the exhaust on uh, Dale's MV. But I have fallen for the trick many times of putting on or even the exhaust that I made from scratch. And years later, I want to quiet the bike down. It means you're old. So here's one, and I've had this similar thing before that I try to explain. I answer these comments, but I can't really do it in detail. But anyway, this is a good, a good point and a valid point. A lot of people, it slips by them. A guy named Mav, and he, th he sent a, a, a comment on the video. He said, he thought I spent a lot of money restoring the GS, and, and boy, I must be loaded that I have all this money to spend on the GS. It's anything but that. And, and I tried to explain to him. Here's what I did spend, that I, the, big, the big item. I spent 700 bucks on a parts bike. Used a lot of parts off it. That gave me a set of wheels, a seat, a gas tank, bodywork, uh, whatever. And I put on a 700 chain conversion, and that was probably $250, maybe $300, but it was years and years ago. And the motor's never been apart. I did a lot of polishing, a lot of hand labor, a lot of cleaning, and a lot of maintenance. But never have I put in thousands of dollars worth of stuff. Now, the exact opposite of that is some of the bikes, and my good friend Vlad has some exotic BMWs and MV Augustas and this, and he spends thousands on bodywork and thousands on imported parts and getting exotic parts. A GS is not an exotic bike, and it usually never breaks. So what you do in terms of polishing, maintenance, and cleaning it, and keeping it nice, and the, Joe Padula put a seat on his bike, the, it really isn't a lot of money. What it is, is a labor of love. Now, if you have an exotic bike like a Vincent, for instance, you're going to pay top dollar for parts and if you can get them. But that's the beauty of the bikes in my collection. I specifically avoid, and Luciano too, bikes that are impossible or hard to get parts for. And Luciano even gets the body work from China for a lot of his bikes and it works just fine. And in my case, having a parts bike, that's the best $700 that I ever spent in 42 years. Now these are the kind of things I really like to get. A fellow named Jules Verne, I, I don't know if he's a 20,000 leagues been leaked to see or what, but anyway. He has a, seven, a 77 RG400, exactly my bike, and he's soda blasting the cases, doing the body work, doing the paint, and he's going to share some, I hope, some photos very soon. We'll find out if he cares to do that or not. But what I always think is, it's always good if you know somebody who has done the work on a bike before you, like I have taken a 77 RD, done blank, 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 made the restoration, did what I thought was appropriate for me. And, and it kind of, I always think it's nice if it inspires you to take an older bike that might be rusty, dirty, high mileage, whatever, and, and bring it back to life. So I hope Jules, Jules, I hope you're going to send us some pictures. And he's going to make, He's going to make the body work yellow like a Kenny Roberts paint job. Good for you. Anyway, I really look forward to the pictures. Now, and this is the kind of comment I think is sad, but it's probably true for a lot of people. A fellow named Steve, not Turbo Steve either. He had a Yamaha YT, a TY-175 and never could get it to run rate. Fiddled with the carburetors, fiddled, fiddled. And he says eventually he just gave up. And he was very frustrated. Well, I always think of a thing, and it's John Kennedy said, we don't go 
we, we don't go to the moon because it's easy. We go because it's hard. When you buy a two-stroke, we don't tune two-strokes because it's easy. We tune them because it's hard. And, and believe me, sometimes it's frustrating, as I know. And sometimes, in my case, what I did with mine, the carbs were so worn out, they were the, the slides were loose and everything, I wound up replacing the carbs. That made it, and I got a really nice video on how to do that, but that made it a lot easier. And some photos, and Henry sends me photos almost every day from his 9,000-mile tour on his Moto Guzzi. Looks like he's sleeping in a tent here with the bears. And I've been out west. The scenery is just spectacular. Thanks, Henry. So here's one that I alluded to on one of the previous videos not long ago that I try to, I try to get across the point to people that I was very happy that I never sold my GS1100. I've got 42 years I've owned it. And so many people responded to that. I can't. I didn't even make a list. I, I get buried with emails, and with comments. So what happened is, I just thought I'd take the highlights of some of them. A fellow named Frederick, he said, and this was very typical of almost all of them. He loved this GS 1100E, and he's so sorry he sold it. I can really relate to that because I have, of course, and I've said it many times. I've sold many things. I wish I could get back my '55 Chevy my air coupe among other things and some of the bikes I the h1s and h2s i sold now good that's that's the sad part of it now jeff and he said he just jeff this is great he just got another gs 1100e and he wanted to thank me well jeff you don't have to thank me thank suzuki for making a good bike that after 42 years people are still lusting after them standing the test of time I'm not sure all the modern bikes that have way overpowered and, and maybe have other good features, track bikes, whatever. I'm not sure 42 years from now they're going to be highly sought after. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I've been wrong in the past. Now, a, a fellow named Fred Bacon. Uh, Fred Bacon Ham. That's a nice name. I love some of these names. Well, they have better names than I do. But, and he has a GS 1150 EF. A drag bike that needed some work and he said he was putting it off putting it off putting it off he started watching stumbled on which most people say they stumble upon my channel I guess YouTube never really puts it out where the big guys go with the uh, <laughs> I'm not sure but anyway he was watching the videos and he of course he loves he loves the GS 1100 series of bikes and after watching the videos he said I was inspired I went and got the work done well, that's great. And he brought it back, and he's out riding it now. I hope he's out riding now. And again, I asked him if he's so inclined, send me some pictures, share it with the people. The people that still have a love of these older bikes after 40-plus years, uh, you see a picture, it warms your heart. It's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to share the pictures. Now, I hope I'm saying this gentleman's name right. Sham Shah Imran. Shah Imran? He said he loves the, the video, the details, and he, he, this actually, I don't know, maybe, maybe somebody scammed me. Maybe this is Turbo Steve wrote this email. He said, you're a cool guy, Wendy. Well, I, <laughs> telling me isn't going to do me much good. you got to tell Karen. That's the trick. Then maybe she'll make me a nice Gavilta fish sandwich or something. Anyway, another little, and these are the funny things. I'm going to get these all out of the way right now. I, I have heard this from many, many, many people. They see a picture of the GS, and they see the tuning forks on the calipers. And they say, well, how come there's Yamaha calipers on a Suzuki? Well, bikes of that era used all some, they used the same, cal the same calipers and just put their own sticker on the outside of it. Yamaha did that, so did Suzuki, so did, I'm not sure about Kawasaki. But anyway, when I, when I have gotten parts that, when I bought the parts bike, I got a whole bunch of parts, a milk crate full of parts. There were brand new calipers in it that were never on a bike, but they had the Yamaha logo. I used them. <laughs> They're still on the bike now, probably 50,000 miles later. So anyway, but they, all the brakes of that era, many of them, and many of the bikes had interchangeable parts in general, and the brake calipers were one. Now Scott is still restoring his barn find 750 Honda. And the purpose of sending me these pictures, he wanted me to comment if he knows I like the color blue or if I like the red or the gold. And I looked at these pictures, I kind of like the blue, but to be honest, 
The color I like the best, and he knows it, is the gold. Now, a really good question from a, a gentleman. I hope I'm saying your name right. S-A-I-F. Safe. I don't know how to say some of these names. Maybe they don't know how to say my name. Erknowski is how you say it. Anyway, he has three R1s. He loves them. And he looked at some of the details, the little carbon fiber brackets and things I made on mine. One of them was the bracket for the master cylinder. And I told him, now a lot of people don't know how to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to try to put this up on, a, on a, uh, the screen. How do you search my channel? If you are in YouTube, you're just in general YouTube here, and you want to find out something from my channel about carbon fiber parts, you put my name in quotation marks, and I'll put that up on the screen. And then the, the, the subject, carbon fiber, or brakes, or tires, or whatever, painting, paintwork, wheels. So that brings you, it narrows down the search from 3,000 videos to probably 10. And you can go through do, 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 and pick the one you want out. Now, what he wanted to do is make some relatively easy brackets. So I hope he's watching this video because I'm going to put some carbon fiber information on right after this. And I said the first thing you do is look at how you want to make the part. Make a carbon fiber, a carbon fiber, a, a cardboard pattern. You can buy sheet carbon fiber off the internet relatively inexpensively. You can cut it out with a saw or grindstone or however you, you cut it. And there's so much of this out on my channel. I don't want to tie up this video with it. Just search the channel for carbon fiber parts. Relatively easy to do. And when I was making camera brackets, I was making some from aluminum, some from carbon fiber. There's a lot of good information there. But anyway... All I can say is when there's a relatively simple thing like the heel guards that go behind the foot pegs, you can take the aluminum ones off, trace them on a piece of carbon fiber sheet, cut it out, and if you want to put a shiny finish on it, buff it out. I've done that many times on, on video, but I don't want to tie up this video about that. What I wanted to explain on this video is, I'm, and I'll, I'm going to have to go out to the garage to show some of this, but I'm planning a project that I wanted to do for years. I just haven't had the time. Our family's been very busy. We had COVID. We have other obligations here. So what's happened is my time has been very limited. But I did get, I did have about a 10-day period I was really sick with COVID. And I took time to make a prototype. I'm going to show that on a video. I think I showed it on the last question and answer. I put it on a bike. I've ridden with it now. I'm happy with it. But now it's time to, to learn from the prototype and make some, well, I'll hope, some very, very nice parts for the MT-09, and take this part, either one of two things, I can finish it, it's not finished yet, I've been riding around without some of the paintwork on it, just to see if I liked it, and let me go out to the garage, and may, it'll make it a lot easier if I can do this from the garage. So while I had COVID earlier in the year, I took the time and took some scraps and made this, what I think is a, I call it a prototype, a test part, because number one, I wasn't sure I'd like it. I wasn't sure it would be practical. I never liked the look of the strap on the seat. I don't like that. I don't ride passengers ever, so I don't need a strap. I didn't like the way it looked. It, it, it took away from the bike. So I made this, and I call this a prototype part. And I learned a lot while I was making it. And the idea of making it was I'm going to be making one for the MT-09 on video in detail but I learned a lot and I want to share some of the things I learned while making this part. Again, this is a prototype part. Now I've made a lot of similar parts from carbon fiber. This is one of them. I have two of these by the way. One that like, has like a backrest that you would use for drag racing. The problem is the higher one that I made for this bike, it made it a little bit awkward getting on and off the bike from time to time so I wasn't crazy about that. But I learned from that don't make the part too high. And this is the FZR part. One of the things you can see to paint, even though at one point in time this paint was buffed like a mirror, as time has gone by and it's been out in the sun and been in use, it has what I call an imprint. The, the material, I didn't make this part, it, it, from certain angles when that light hits it right there, it has, you can see the imprint of the material. And this is made from e-glass and polyester resin. And that's very typical of when they don't put enough gel coat in. The gel coat is there, so it disguises that. 
Now I made this part for the RD and you can see there's no imprint at all and I'm going to show and explain how I got away with making that part because this is a final part. That's a part I really wanted to use and I used it for many years before I did the second restoration on the RD. Again, it's personal, but I never liked the look of the strap on the seat. That was always one of the things I'm trying to eliminate. Now on the MT-09, I haven't taken the strap off yet because I haven't really figured out how I want to do it. But having that strap gone and having that back, on, I say with this bike, it's very unique. The more blue things I painted on a bike, the more I like the style of it. The blue as opposed to flat black or in this case seat color seat cover material I think it just adds to the style of the bike and I had to make a lot of little carbon fiber parts to this I had to modify the windshield with these little carbon fiber parts a lot of little stuff here and every step of the way there's always little tricks and tips they're all on the video already but I want to I want to make this kind of a basic 101 and I want to start right at the beginning and this is a spare R1 seat that I use from time to time. It has a little backrest. I call it a backrest. But, but again, every time I make one of these parts, I learn something, and hopefully I can pass some of it on. Now, anytime you make exhaust system parts or covers for exhaust systems, these are made with Huntsman resin. And Huntsman resin is very, very toxic and very critical on the mixture. I would suggest if you're doing this save anything that's going to get hot or exhaust system parts for somewhere after you've got your skills honed a little bit but a part like this that's just a cosmetic part I don't think it's out of the realm of anybody and we're going to do one for real on the MT-09 in detail multiple videos I know people are going to complain they got too long but it's okay the idea is to pass on information so you would be able to make similar parts for your own bike so my prototype part, when you get back to the pro, you can see how it, the, the weave, and this is made with twill, how it's already coming through. Now, I did not, and, and I never in the beginning when I was playing with this and making it, I never thought I'd keep it as a final part, and I don't intend to. I never even put the paint trim on. I have a little pattern for some gold I want to put on the seat. But I never did that yet because I wanted to see how long it was going to take before the twill would come through. And twill comes through a lot quicker than weave. And that, of course, I don't want to have that in my final part. And I'm going to show how I would get away with that using light e-glass cloth when I make the final part that's going to be on the MT-09. I know Scott will be interested in that. He's making some parts right now. And I've also, these are the little lessons. If you were to make this part and not know some of the tricks, it would be very difficult. But if I think by passing on the tips and tricks, that part or something similar to that would not be out of the realm of anybody. Now molding up a part like for the, the headlight replacement, those two, I call them covers, I call them the Josh Hayes covers. Those are super, super complicated. I won't even get into that now. This is another thing. Molding up where you're replacing the headlights on a bike. There's certain things that are just very complicated. And I want to stay away from them right now. But I do want to talk about ways you can make a relatively simple carbon fiber part. So just to summarize what I just went through out in the garage. The... Making a prototype part is a good idea, especially if you're not, if it's in the middle of the winter, you're not going to ride the next day or so, and you have material, usually the material is inconsequential. Making a prototype part to see, mm -mm, it didn't come exactly right, which is what happened with mine, I got to bleed through on it and everything. I, I kind of knew that was going to happen, but the cure for it is, and I, when you're done with the carbon fiber, especially if you use twill, twill tends to come through horribly. That's why we ordered uh, from Midgley. I'm getting some different material. I hope will be better. But it's always a good idea, and I'm going to show this when I make the MT-09 video, of how to get the final skin on with light fiberglass cloth. And, and it minimizes or almost always eliminates the bleed through. We're going to show that on the final video. And, of course, the part that's on the bike, I may be able to salvage. I may be able to sand that down, put the gold trim on put some more clear on. I don't know yet. I don't know, but that's a winter project. I don't usually work on things until it really gets cold. Um, 
I tried a release agent. Usually, I want to show this. If I was making this part and I want to cover it, well, I want to make, well, let me get that dust off it. The, the, you want to put a, make a carbon fiber part. So you have the part, you want to put a skin of carbon fiber on it. Well, that's usually pretty easy, and I've done a windshield video and different ones that it shows how to do that. But, but the, the hardest thing is to understand is really two basic ways to make a part. You make it, you put a skin on a part you already have, and or you make a buck. In this case, Turbo Steve did this. He carved the back seat out of his, his uh, Vigione. He carved it out of foam, cover it with fiberglass cloth. That's one, another way to do it. But in essence, when you're done with the part, you have to put the finish on. Now, the, the second way to do it is you get the part, put the finish on the part, and then make a mold. And from the mold, the mold already has the finish on it. If you're going to make more than one part, that's a, better, a little bit better way to do it. You save time. But if you're only going to make one part, and usually I'm, I like to make one part because then I have the only one. I, I like to have unique, like the MT-09 windshield, I have those custom little pieces on the end. And the bracketing is all carbon fiber. Well, some people don't care about that. They just buy the cosmetic, the commercial stuff. But if you care, if it's for you, and you always do these things for you, you don't do them for other people. So there's basically two ways to make this part, or any part. Now, Scott is making, or maybe he's already done with it, I didn't get pictures yet, the uh, carbon fiber. Uh, he's missing a side panel for one of the Hondas, the, the barn finds he had. Yeah. If, if you can carve, and Scott's an accomplished woodworker, carve it out of wood. But you got to have a release agent. So in other words, once I make this, it, I, if I'm going to make a carbon fiber part, I need to be able to pull the carbon fiber part off the buck. And normally you'd use PVA, if you're doing it that way, PVA or some other release agent. But I tried using, when I made that prototype part, I just, I didn't have any around, I just used saran wrap. I cover, I used the seed itself, and what I did, I covered it with saran wrap. And that was fine, but then I talked to Dave Midgley, and he had an even better idea. These bad, I have a bunch of them over there. These bags that they use to make, you put cookies in, and you put the bag around it, and then you heat shrink it, and it shrinks down. Well, yeah, that would be able to get some of the wrinkles out, maybe, make a little less sanding. We're going to, when we make the part, we're going to try that. But that's the fun of doing your own projects, is you can experiment, you can learn, and in, if you're so inclined, you can share. That's why we have the channel. Okay, the carbon fiber bleed through, we know there's a, a tentative cure for that when we do the real MT-09 part. Actually, we're going to try to fix that part, that, that prototype. We're going to find out. That's what winters are for. And the light cloth for the final finish, I know that has worked in modeling. I don't see why it wouldn't work on a motorcycle. It's a lot easier to do a motorcycle than a model airplane. Uh, that's for sure. Now, I the things I wanted to just touch on are we use for these parts, that cosmetics parts, West Systems resin. You can buy that in any marine store. There's different kinds of hardener. If you're going to see the carbon, if you're going to see it as a carbon finish, you want the the hardener that dries clear, otherwise it dries with a little bit of a brown tint, especially as time goes by. It actually turns really brown. The Some of the little things, if you, you can make yourself as, if you're starting out with carbon fiber, you can make a sheet. I've shown that on a video many times. Get a piece of glass, put some PVA or saran wrap, and lay out the carbon fiber, put, put the resin down, and the side that face the glass is going to be pretty nice. Well, you can do a little sanding, put a little clear urethane on that, and you can have a license plate bracket, heel pads, a bracket that would hold for the gentleman that wanted the R1 parts. But a lot of it is just very, very simple stuff, and it's it's on the, over the course of many, many videos. So if somebody is really, really interested in this, I can say just do the channel search and get used to searching my channel or if you're searching generically, you, you have to have a way of, if you just go to YouTube and put carbon fiber, sometimes something, guitars come up or something else. Anyway, um, the final thing here, I guess, is, and, and be aware of this, if you're, if you're ever tempted to make exhaust parts and use any of the real high temperature resins, like Huntsman, some of those resins are not made 
to be used by individuals. They're made by, for professional only, and they can be toxic, and you should always read the, the literature that comes with them. But I have made exhaust systems. I have made brackets. I made those parts on the R1. And as long as you're aware of what the danger is, and you should never sand that stuff and breathe it in, um, as long as you're cautious about it and wear a mask and try to work outdoors whenever possible, I think you have a good shot at making some decent carbon fiber parts, even the first time you try. Now, because we're talking about doing exhaust parts, these are the original parts that came with the R1. And I wanted to just show this and touch on a couple of things that maybe people don't understand. I wanted to make my own muffler, the cans that go on the end. So, of course, I started with making my own molds. That was pretty easy and pretty straightforward. All this is on the video somewhere. I, a long time ago, though. And I took all, used the pipes that came with the original parts. And here I'm making the, the cones that go on the end. And this, this was pretty uh, labor intensive job, I have to admit. This took a lot longer than I thought it would, but it's made with Huntsman, Huntsman high temperature resin. You can't use ordinary West resin to make anything that gets over 160 degrees. These are rubber molds that I pulled the parts from. And again, this is pretty straightforward stuff. We, we may at some point in time update this video, bring it all up to date. But as long as we're talking about making your own carbon fiber parts, and sometimes you just look at this and you get your own ideas. I made that exhaust system. It lasted seven years before I got sick of it being too loud. Now, but the bottom line on this was I had made an exhaust system for the GS that lasted four or five years before the resin got so brown and, and ugly that I abandoned it. And I wanted to try with the Huntsman resin and Dave Midgley helped me get the resin. It's not available to individuals, commercial only. And I wanted to take, I had a spare R1 exhaust system that I bought from Ron, who was the head of the, uh, the parts department at Motorcycle Mall when I bought the bike. I got his exhaust. He had an R1 too. And I did all this, all these little things that I thought, and I was just doing this as an exercise to see if I could do it. And I really, of course, you could just go buy an exhaust system. And some of them uh, at the time, I think the one Ron replaced his with, and it's why he had the, the ordinary exhaust, was $2,700. I thought, well, I, let me see what I can do. And this, I had most of the material. I had the twill. I made the cones. I made them on a PVC pipe. Uh, you can see some of the work I did attaching the cones here to the the back piece. Um, and again, th this was the, turns into a labor of love. When I was all done, it turns out each one of the mufflers was nine pounds lighter than the stock ones were. So I saved 18 pounds here. <laughs> but of course, I'm not racing anybody, so it doesn't matter anyway. But it did have a throaty, nice, beautiful sound. The only problem with it is, the only real problem with this, when we were riding in Harriman Park, nobody cared. When we're riding in the area where I ride now, where you have to have a pretty much you have to go through miles of where houses are on both sides of the road and littered with radar traps and everything it you don't i don't want to have a loud bike anymore like i said earlier in the video i'm old here's one of the ones i made relative to the uh the the stock one and you save the weight you get the noise but then at some point in time i wanted to have the bike back to stock and i always try to make things that i can always put them back to stock and back in those days, having that loud exhaust on the R1 when I had the Ferrari stickers on it, and we would, here I don't even have the headlight covers made yet, but I always love having these pictures of the bike. I have the high seat on it, and this exhaust didn't change the tuning much at all, but boy, when you got on the gas, was it ever loud. It was, it was exciting, to, to say the least. But now that I'm a lot older, <laughs> having the quiet exhaust back on the bike and always always make it that you can put the stock parts back on i enjoy that more than you could ever know so i'm going to end the video by saying i hope you got some good information you're entertained all of the above this is a picture the last one scott sent me he's getting ready to restore this one and hope you really really did enjoy the video 
and thanks so much for watching.